Yeah. Music can have a good thing to it. Still mighty. But thinking back about that film, how do you look well, as a filmmaker now, all the other films today, looking back at Mortal Kombat specifically, how do you feel about that film now that you'll find it's press? Mortal Kombat! <laughs> <laughs> Um, I love it. Uh, I mean, I love it. I love Mortal Kombat. It's just awesome. And uh, it's, uh, I'm still very good friends with Robin Shu, who is uh, Lee Kang, yeah. who's uh, currently in South Africa. We're doing uh, Death Race 3 at the moment. Jeremy and I are producing it. He's had to. Because one, one of the quintessential 90s things about it, I think, is Robin Shu's hair. Yeah. Big 90s hair. He's so proud of his hair. It's fantastic. And it's one of the reasons why I cast him in Death Race as a character with, who had to shave his hair off. So it's like every couple of years, you know, Robin finally grows his big, long 90s hair back. And then, so he looks like he's had Bon Jovi or something. <laughs> and then boom, we have to have kind of uh, shave it all off for him. Um, no, I, I love that. I look back on that film with great, great fondness. Anyone else? Question? Yes. A lot of lying, <laughs> uh, because um, I I came when Jeremy and I went to LA. Um, shopping had been very well received in the, in Sundance. I mean, it was uh, generally uh, well liked by American studios and American filmmakers, um, much more so than the British. Uh, the British didn't really like shopping at all. We got some just dreadful reviews and and kind of pointless criticism as well, like. Um, I remember one review said, Jude Law is too good looking to be an actor. And, and for me, that's exactly what was wrong with the British film industry at the time, was you could make a comment like that. Um, and uh, so, but in America, people liked it because the movie it had cost virtually no money, it looked really stylish. So I was kind of a filmmaker who was of interest to American studios because I could make like five bucks and <clears throat> like 50 bucks. Um, and uh, so I took meetings on Mortal Kombat, and that was when uh, video game movies weren't seen as a particularly good idea. Uh, Super Mario Brothers had not worked, Double Dragon had not worked. So there wasn't, you know, Ridley Scott was not kind of banging <laughs> the doors down at New Line Cinema to do Mortal Kombat the movie. And they didn't even have a script at that point, it was still an outline. Um, and uh, I met with Mike DeLuca, um, who was the head of production of the studio at the time. And, uh, and I impressed him with my tremendous knowledge of visual effects. Um, which I got by reading lots of books about it. And uh, so I just, uh, because his big question was, well, how do you transition from making this very low budget movie into making a big visual effects extravaganza? And I came out with all of these buzzwords that I'd literally learned, um, you know, the night before from reading all of these books that I bought the day before. And, um, and I kind of reassured him that I knew what I was doing. And then after I got the job, I really, I learned really fast. And I made it a point of going into all of the visual effects houses and kind of learning everything that I kind of bullshitted about, I actually learned about. Um, and that was kind of the start of my love of visual effects, really. And I, I'm, I, st I still stay very, very involved in the actual creation of the visual effects for the movies I do. So a, a lot of, um, you know, uh, bravado and, and bullshit. But, but also, I think the studios saw within shopping, you know, the ambition of an a action uh, filmmaker. Uh, you know, Paul was not going to make kitchen sink drama based on shopping, and I think that uh, that's what particularly it was the potential that, that New Line were responding to. Yeah, I mean, uh, shopping we made on a, a Channel Four budget. Channel Four is one of the British TV stations in England, and traditionally, you know, for that budget, you would make a kitchen sink or you make a drama. You know, a few people, you know, maybe they go out to the pub or something, and that'd be your big location. And, they walk down the street and you do a tracking shot, and that's about as ambitious as those movies got. You know, for the same budget, we had car chasers, helicopters, smoke machines, fight scenes, riots, um, and I think you know that that definitely you know got got some attention for us. And we were the only movie at Sundance with like a rock and roll soundtrack, of great looking kids. And I remember that Sundance the year we were there was particularly navel gazing. It was all about how difficult it is to be you know a young. Uh, it was all about kind of uh, young children and kind of movie producers. It was very kind of Hollywood, Hollywood kind of navel gazing at the time. The movies were quite boring, and I think we were seen as a breath of fresh air. Next, yes. I'm just wondering, you seem to have this very sincere commitment to genre cinema in a bunch of different forms, whether it's horror or action or anything. Like that. Do you feel that you're sort of, you know, you're, 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 you're
references here because it's quite underrated and delightful. It's like kind of a old fashioned squad cluster. In some directions, it's pretty good for something that you get past and you move on in your career. But his life unpretentiously stuck in anything genre music for a long time. He just talks about getting an ACM in Japan for this sort of I mean, I, I make movies I, I love to go see. You know, these are the kind of movies I grew up watching, and these are still the kind of movies when I have spare time, I go and see in the cinema. So, um, and uh, you know, the, I, you know, we've never done anything for a paycheck. We make things out of a passion for movies. We make movies that we really love. Um, making movies is hard. You know, it's like hard work, and I like to enjoy myself when I'm working and, and that means I have to make something that I really really love and um, you know those like those are the films that we make and uh, and I think genre filmmaking is very underrated um, it's almost like you know and, and Mila says this frequently it's like drama is easy man it's easy compared to like doing fight scenes and being so wet and then still having to deliver dialogue I mean, um, so it's 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 hard work, but it's really for me very rewarding work because um, I, I just love these movies. Next, yes. I always find in Ed Edwards the caliber of the acting and cast itself is so spectacular to participate in movies on that level. What was the cast itself your first choice? Was there anyone else you liked in the role that you liked sort of the most thought of first? Um. Pretty much, we most of the people were our first choices. I mean, it was an interesting casting process because I really wanted to open it up. So I think Fishburne's role is originally written. Where he was like a big white Texan guy, and uh, but I love Fishburne and I really wanted to work with him. So we, we kind of rewrote it for him. Jolie Richardson's role was a man. Uh, Lieutenant Stark was a guy originally, and um, and I just uh, Jolie had just come out in 101 Dalmatians. And I thought, what fun to kind of take the girl from 101 Dalmatians and just dump 200 gallons of blood all over her. <laughs> and also, she was a particular kind of like English Rose as well. And she was from a very respected theatrical family, uh, the Richardsons and the Red Graves. And, uh, and I just thought, you know, that her in this movie would be particularly kind of edgy. Um, so, you know, we, we did rewrite for a lot of actors. Um, but I, I don't think there was anyone that we went after that we didn't get. I mean, people were excited to be in the movie. We, um, we were just huge fans of Fishburne from Deep Cover. Um, and we, we just think his voice, we just believe, he's like Morgan Freeman or you know, certain Liam Neeson, especially when you're going to make horror and you're asking the audience to go to places that are a little bit of a stretch. If you have an actor with that amount of gravitas, you believe what they say. So when Fishburne says, you know, this ship, the ship is alive. You believe it, you know. With some actors with less gravitas and without that wonderful voice, you may not believe it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. He's very, yeah, he's an unbelievably cool guy. He, my favourite uh, memory of him is um, we set up this gym for all of the actors at the studio because they all had to do their own wire work, and it's you know it's very difficult in wires. You have to have very strong core um, because uh, otherwise you get tired very quickly. Um, so we set up this uh, um, kind of upside down crunching device where you would hang upside down, you know, in those gravity defined boots, and then you you do sit ups upside down. And I walked into the gym one time, and the fish was hanging upside down, and uh, and he started talking to me about the script and what we we're going to be shooting that day. And eventually, he worked his way around to what he really wanted to say, which was he was exhausted and he couldn't get off these fucking gravity boots. <laughs> and would I mind helping him then? But he was just too damn cool to kind of come out with it straight away. <laughs> so he was a, he was a great, great guy to work with. And I learned an awful lot from him. He was a very, very generous actor. Next. Yeah. If you had the hell footage, would you put it back? Because seeing the film and when you reach that point, uh, it's so over the top and it's um, the less you see is more effective and it becomes more ultimately more t terrifying when it gets to that point. Would you actually go back and change that kind of stuff? I, I think um, using the same editing pattern of like, you know, one, two frame cuts, I think you could get a lot more in there. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah I mean, I don't think it will be an extended 10 minutes worth of, yeah. you know, uh, of, of, of kind of, of hell, hellish unpleasantness. Yeah. And I think it would all be very fast. Um, no, the, the, if the movie had a longer running time, it would be, you know, reinstating things like um, 
like the floating tooth, which was just fantastic. I mean, it was really, it was like the space station shot from 2001, where you thought you were up to something huge, and then it turns out it's just a tooth, and it's got a bit of flesh hanging off it. And, I mean, it was just great. And, uh, and um, you know, Fishburne's reaction to it was awesome. That's a funny scene, actually. We didn't realize until we, uh, until we were shooting it, is that all the people who stay on the Lewis and Clark and watch on the monitors were all British actors. And all of the people who actually went on to the event horizon and did the dangerous hard work were all Americans. <laughs> like, ah, the American spirit of adventure compared to British, no, you go to Paris. And I'll stay on the spaceship. It's warm. Have a cup of tea. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Since you're filming here of Resident Evil 5 in Toronto and you've been to many countries and cities, what do you like about Toronto? In Canada. Um, it's, uh, it's a town that's really rich in fantastic locations, which is why we're here. And uh, it's also just a very civilized place to, to make movies. I mean, Mila and I love it here. I think she would move here if she could. Um, so, uh, and it's very, very good crews here, good studio space. I mean, it's a really, it's a great place to make movies. The Canadian dollar could get a bit weaker, that would help. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when we first started working here, it was great because you'd go to Starbucks in the, in the airport and you kind of like order a couple of cups of coffee and give them five bucks and they give you six dollars back. <laughs> With coffee, you know, like, wow, I thought we were like making money here, it's great. <laughs> those days are gone, unfortunately. Yes, you, sir. With the Gothic architecture and the sort of townscape that they travel through and travel through space, that Brian has kind of been adopted by the Warhammer gaming community sort of having similarities. I was just going to ask if you were familiar with the source material or if that has ever come up to you before. Ask we love Warhammer. Yeah? Yeah. We actually wanted to make a movie of Warhammer and spent quite a few uh, months talking to them. But uh, well, Sally didn't amount to anything, so. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, I always think Paul, had he not been a filmmaker, would have been an architect. Because without disrespecting our production designers, they essentially really just facilitate his vision. And I don't know if it's because he's from the north of England where there are a few castles. Um, <laughs> but there's a medieval component to an awful lot of what we do. And um, I think at the time we called it almost techno medieval, being the 90s and techno music. And then we had Orbital on the soundtrack. Um, so we, that was very much where we were coming from. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, actually, I would love to do a, uh, a medieval movie, a crusader movie with Paul at some point, to bring him out. 